and welcome back to Literally Literary. If this is your first time joining us, be sure to check out our previous episodes. This episode, we are continuing our discussion on Bad Mexican, Bad American by Jose Hernandez Diaz. Today, we're joined by Jose himself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Welcome. Thanks for having me. Welcome, Jose. Yeah, it's an honor to be here. So, you know, we had a great event last, a great set of events last night, right? The the reading at Valle Verde and then the open mic at the Pink Cloud through the Barbed Wire Open Mic Series. Uh, what's been your experience here so far? It's been a really great, refreshing experience just to be around folks who are united and and warm and, and inviting. And the poetry reading was, was uh, my favorite. And just to hear everybody get on the mic and read their work and, and read work that inspires them and um <clears throat> it was it was just a uh, refreshing I haven't I haven't been to an open mic in a while so mm. um yeah just great to have the desert landscape in the background and the city is um it's interesting to me I've, I, I've never really been in a city like in the middle of what looks like a desert so mm-hmm. um kind of reminds me of Las Vegas a little bit mm. but um yeah it's just been refreshing and and um, like I said, the the people have been very friendly. That's great. That's good to hear. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. makes you want to come back. Hopefully. Oh, def- <laughs> definitely. Yeah. Um, you just going off of that, you said you don't where well, you hadn't been to an open mic in a while. Did yeah. you perform at open mics before when you would write? Before sometimes, you yeah, not a lot. I was very I was very nervous about it. Like initially when I started. My first ever reading, I had a couple of beers just to like mm-hmm. get rid of the nerves. And so as a writer, I started off very introverted, very uh, shy, um, and uh, which is weird because I played football and I was actually pretty good back then, but I was very shy. And um, my friend's parents would always tell me like, do you talk? Like you just sit there and <laughs> observe everything. But I think that's kind of where the writerly <clears throat> observations came and attention to detail, you know, being, mm-hmm. being the quiet one in the, in the back. <laughs> but, um, and also a lot of the readings, um, they tend to be, um, more spoken word, I think. And my writing, I don't know if it necessarily qualifies as spoken word. Mm. Um, so, and also just, um, I think I'm naturally, um, a bit of a hermit. I was telling Jorge, my, my father's kind of a hermit, doesn't go out much. But that does lead to a lot of writing, you know, because so, mm. I can just like make a weekend of just going to the library and not talking to anybody, <laughs> just like <laughs> writing, reading, submitting, which is good. But um, I'm trying to balance it out more now, you know, now that I got the books written, mm-hmm. trying mm. to break out of that that shell a little bit. Yeah, because that's such a huge part of, of the book is is, you know, reading it out loud, going and visiting and uh, promoting i was uh i didn't mention it last night i, I meant to uh while i was hosting but i was waiting for you to sing the ranchetta i was, I was like come on man sing it. i did that one on the campus i didn't sing it i wanted to sing it but yeah. i'm like terrified of like messing it up <laughs> in my in my book launch in venice um i brought my mom and she sang it for everybody so i sing it like at, at home and okay. karaoke and stuff <laughs> i think it's pretty good but like yeah. i'm terrified to do it like in person i did recite the poem in spanish mm. which was the first time mm. i've ever done that oh, in, that's uh, awesome. <clears throat> in person so yeah next time you just have to fly her out with you you know, know. at the events and yeah. Yeah. Oh, she loves it she grew up singing and and um sometimes we go down to the the piojito in east l.a and, and they have a karaoke there on top on the top floor and um and a buffet, and she just sings all mm-hmm. the, you know, all the classics. So. Yeah, you gotta start having your own entourage. I know. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> my my mom, my dog, and my twin brother. Yeah. <laughs> my posse. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's the way to show up at open mics and style, you know. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Uh, one thing we we were talking about before we started recording, uh, we did have EPCC students uh, there at the event, and of course you read at the college, but. You forgot to mention that about community college, your your role in connection to community college. Yeah, you know, in high school, I was mentioning that. I played football. I was getting, like, Ds and Cs and partying and indifferent to, to school. And then my junior year English teacher mentioned that my in-class essay was really well-written. And um, she said, you should be getting As. And 
and that inspired me to to read and, and take it more seriously. And she told me I could be a writer, and that really inspired me. And back then, I didn't really have... Yeah, it's de- the book is dedicated to my mm-hmm. parents and to her. Um, and all, my, all of my books will be dedicated to my parents. Um, but um, after that, <clears throat> it was kind of late to get into college at that point. It was like the end of my junior year when I started taking it more seriously. So I had to um, go to community college first and... Luckily, it was kind of away from the high school I went to, so I was able to focus on just studying, and hmm. and my friends were, you know, in another neighborhood. So, um, and it was the first time I saw Mexican professors and and instructors, and um, so that was refreshing, and I felt like it was more community based and less competition than than the high school I went to, which was kind of like a middle class, upper middle class neighborhood, even though I wasn't in those categories, but. Um, so it was, it was inspiring to see, um, also predominantly Brown campus that the community college was that I went to. And I just focused on my studies and, and, um, I got straight A's until my last semester when I had to take eight classes in order to transfer in time. Mm. And they were like, you have to get special permission to do that. And they signed off on it. And I was working at the library too, part time, but, um, and the last the last semester, I got four A's and four B's. Yeah, but I, I still got in to Berkeley. But yeah, yeah. Wow. <clears throat> um, I guess what are my questions? Which one should I do first? <laughs> <laughs> um, we kind of talked about it in the earlier episodes when we were discussing your book, but like how you've been published in so many places, yeah. um, and. As far as like I know, um, a lot of the writing journey comes with rejection and you have to be able to accept rejection. Um, so I'm kind of curious, like on with you having been published in all these places, like yeah. how I guess like I'm trying to find the words. <laughs> um, like how, I guess like, yeah, how do you accept rejection or like how do you deal with rejections? Yeah. Because obviously if you're getting published in so many places, you're probably also getting rejected from a lot of places. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, to me, initially it was hard to deal with rejections and I didn't understand it. I assumed it meant the work was bad or not finished or somehow not worthy of publication. But then I started working with magazines, Frontier, Behind the Scenes, Lunch Ticket at uh, Antioch in my MFA. And I started to see there was just so many submissions and quality submissions that plenty plenty of quality work was getting rejected. It wasn't personal or it wasn't always because the work was, um, you know, not quality. And so I started to research the, you know, percentages of these magazines, the top tier, and it was like a 1% to 3% acceptance rate. So um, my professor at Antioch, Richard Garcia, told me that for one, one out of every 10 submissions, he would get one acceptance. And he was a professor, mm-hmm. you know? And, you know, he had won awards, had books. So that really showed me that the rejections are inevitable and and it doesn't always mean bad. And um, part of it is, is uh, to be a successful published, widely published poet. Part of it is talent. Part of it is, is um, work ethic. But it's also the ability to bounce back from rejection, not to, to not, not take it so personally, which is hard, you know? Yeah. I, I still, I still get mad sometimes, you know? Yeah. Like, oh, these idiots, you know? Yeah. But, Some people have a vendetta against the press. Like they never accept my work. Yeah. <laughs> you you kind of learn after a while to not have that because it sometimes you will get in there eventually. You're like, oh, they, yeah. I love them now, you know? Like, <laughs> yeah. I hate them. They're, you know, they're this and that or they don't like my Spanglish or like something. You'll think of something and then they accept another one. You're like, oh, we're best buds now, you know. (laughs) But um, then there are other magazines that you consistently get rejected from and you kind of realize like like 32 Poems, for example, not to put them on blast, but um, they always (laughs) reject me. But I kind of realize it's like an aesthetic difference, you know. Like my Mm. style is kind of subversive, surreal and and uh, has a, kind of like a shocking quality to it. And they're a little more reticent. And, and um, so it makes sense why I'm not in there, you know. So I, I stopped taking it personally. <laughs> yeah. um, and then, there, and then um, there are some that 
like when I submitted to the Southern Review after three years of rejections, I thought like I'm literally wasting my time, you know, like I don't I don't think anyone's even gonna read this. Like I'm throwing my submission into into the unknown, you know? Mm-hmm. So I remember thinking like I'm wasting my time. And the next day I got an acceptance from from them and I was like, damn, that was, that was a trip. <laughs> and then um like with the Yale review, I spent ten years submitting to them, you know. When I first started submitting, yeah. it was it was through the through the snail mill, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. And at first it was just standard rejections, you know. And then eventually, like after like six years, they were like, Oh, we kinda like this one. Send send some more. And I was like, Oh. And so when you start noticing these these um personal messages mm-hmm. and, mm-hmm. and uh encouragement, just submit again. Mm-hmm. That's when I would yeah. you know, really try to get in there and mm-hmm. yeah. and then and then eventually they said, Oh, we like this one, but it was accepted somewhere else. And so I said, okay, next year I'm getting in there. And um, I waited till the, they're only open like in November for a couple months, I think. Mm -hmm. And um, I submitted and and got in. And so it's just, it's it's a bit of a crapshoot, some of it. Um, Not in the sense, like if the work isn't ready, you won't, you probably won't get published, you know. Mm -hmm. But if the work is ready and you do your research on the journals and, um, and you try to be objective with your work, not like all oh, my work is great. Like some of it needs, you know, editing and revision as well. Yeah. And time, time always helps the revision process with the fresh eyes mm-hmm. as you as you come back to it. So um, it's just a learning experience. Like I said, some of the introverted, obsessive, one track mind that I kind of have, kind of worked out for that in in uh, understanding the. Um, the literary magazine um, culture and, and just um, rejections and everything. Yeah. yeah. How, how do you uh, manage, like, keep track and manage all your submissions? What do you send where? The status? Submittable like, you... or? Yeah, well, like 95% of it is on submittable, yeah. you know? Mm-hmm. And then I used to, for the longest time, I would have the non-submittable submissions mm-hmm. list. And those were magazines that were not on submittable that I submitted to. Mm-hmm. And I would just email myself that list every time a poem got picked up, for example, in the Cincinnati Review, mm-hmm. because it's not on submittable. So, and now I just kind of memorize. There's not a lot that are not on submittable anymore, you know? Yeah. So I kind of yeah. just, yeah. And I want to give a shout out to some of our local uh, literary mags. You know, I, I know yesterday you heard about some of them and I know you submitted to some of them, right? Yeah. So we have Barrio Panther right here behind me, literally, right? Oh, yeah. And then we have uh, Chrysalis Magazine where Vanessa has actually served as editor before. For sure. We have also Re Grande Review um, yeah. that I've submitted. I've never gotten accepted, so I kind of just stopped. But, <laughs> um, you know. I did the same thing with them. And I normally yeah. don't stop, but, like, they wouldn't even respond. So That's I just kind of thought, like, oh, yeah. maybe they don't like it because I yeah. don't know. Yeah. 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 But um, also, also sometimes that's just management. Sometimes, like, mm. it's not managed well or something. Mm-hmm. But but uh, Barrio Panther, I was in the last issue. I had two, two poems, three poems in there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I haven't got my copy yet, but um, I was in there. I used to submit to Border Senses. I don't think it's 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 a uh, active. Anymore. No, yeah. it's journal. No, but technically the open mic is part of Border oh, okay. Senses mm-hmm. and, and the mm-hmm. podcast. Yeah, mm-hmm. they used to have online journal, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and maybe even print. I'm not sure, but we did have print for a while yeah. too. But yeah, we're we're working on getting it back. Yeah, yeah. No, I try to submit to all of like the Chicano ones. We it. I've been in We it two or three times. And uh, I sent those review. I've been like four or five times. Um, Latino literatures. I've been in there. Um, yeah. So, what's the most surprising acceptance for you from all of them? Um, well, the, I would say the y'all review, but I did, I did see that they were like encouraging me, you know. Mm-hmm. But um, I, I would probably say Iowa review and the Southern review. Um, I would say the Southern Review because, like I said, at that time when I submitted to them, I thought I was wasting my time, and I thought they were too big that, like, they probably had an intern read my poem. Like, what are these weird poems? And <laughs> you know, so sometimes like the the harder ones are to, to get into are the ones that require you to go through several readers, you know, because mm-hmm. if your work mm-hmm. is experimental um, or subversive or kind of non traditional, it might not appeal to 
a general wider audience, whereas mm. more traditional work mm. might be more appealing to a vast number of readers. So I kind of had more luck with just like when it goes directly to the editor, you know, mm. so. Um, I want to ask you about um, your process with writing. Yeah. So because you're introverted nature and, you know, a hermit, as you call yourself, yeah. um, is it something where you sit and you already have an idea or you just kind of like get inspired with something or you're reading um, and then start writing or, um, and particularly in Bad Mexican, Bad American, you have several poems that kind of have that same template of, you know, a man in a blank t-shirt. Yeah. Um, so I'm wondering if, if that was something that was planned or you just did one and really enjoyed it and then wanted yeah. to do more like that. So I guess that's like a two part question. No, that's a great <laughs> question. It, it tends to vary. Sometimes, um, when I'm working with my generative workshops, I have to come up with prompts mm -hmm. and, for example, write about going on a date with a deceased artist. And that's when I mm. wrote um, my date with Frida Kahlo. Mm. And um, so to show the students how to respond to a prompt. Mm. Um, and then, so a lot of times with the general workshops that I'm teaching, I will create a lot of new work because um, it's also a way, I make, a way that I make a living by doing these generative workshops. And then sometimes, like the one you're mentioning with the, the man in the Chicano Batman shirt, um, I'll, I'll already have an idea about a series. So when I go down to write, I already know that I'm entering the space of, of the persona. And um, a lot of times I will use verbs to, as catalysts for my poems, like fell. Okay, the man in the pink Floyd shirt mm. fell. And, and, I, and I know that the verb is going to be the catalyst for the poem, you know. Um, so for a while, I was just writing just like Googling verbs like randomly and just mm -hmm. like, okay, the man in the pink Floyd shirt jumped over a puddle. He was getting chased by a chihuahua and just like keep improvising and building. So mm -hmm. I know this all sounds pretty crazy, but um, <laughs> it's kind of a, a organic process that um, some of them I used that um, the persona of the man in the insert name here shirt and then the verb is the catalyst for the action. And some of them were from prompts. And some of them are just from real life experiences, you know. And mm. some of them are paying respects to my parents for their sacrifices. And and some of them are talking about my upbringing as a first gen, low income um, Chicano in Southeast LA, yeah. North Orange County. And a lot of it is from living in both of those, Northern Orange County, Southeast LA, I moved when I was like 14. And, that, and like, that's a big difference. Like Northern mm -hmm. Orange County is kind of like a middle class, like mainstream neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And then Southeast LA is like Mexican neighborhood, you know? So a lot of, a lot of my upbringing was, when I was younger, you know, it was confusing and, and um, that back and forth, you know? Mm -hmm. It's almost like an invisible mm -hmm. border there between Orange County and L.A. County, you know. Mm. We're, we're Orange County, more suburban. L.A. County, m a little more urban, you know. Mm -hmm. So all of that is in my work and, um, yeah. Kind of along those same lines as Rena was saying, um, you know, w w one... Of course, one of the big kinds of works in, in that you that you like to practice, right, is is the prose poem. And so I wanted to ask, like, why, like, what is it about the prose poem that you gravitate toward as opposed to just writing in verse? I think because I've always had this like independent, um, contrarian, counterculture, subversive like personality. Mm -hmm. And I think my family's like that. Like, we're talking, and they'll say the opposite just to like say the opposite of what you said, you know, like kind of have to be different. So mm. growing up, I liked like punk rock music, underground hip hop, anything that wasn't on the radio, you know what I mean? Because it was subversive. So the, the prose poem is, is like the rock and roll of poetry, you know? Mm. I always say that poetry is capital P, poetry, capital P poetry verse, linear verse is like Michael Jordan and prose poetry is like Dennis Rodman, you know? Mm. And so... As you can tell with the book, the first section is predominantly linear verse about my real life growing up because 
I have to have that too. If if I ignore that, that's like ignoring who I am, and and um, it's very therapeutic to write those poems, empowering, and I love those poems too, you know. But the prose poem to me was like when I was younger, wanted to be in a band or wanted to be like an underground poet MC, you know. Mm. So it's kind of like living through that rock star persona, um, through the prose poem, the innovation, the spontaneity, um, the surrealism, the surrealism. Mm. It was an escape. Mm. It wasn't. It wasn't just um, social realism. It was. It was um, a way to. Maybe I'm not going to mention all these hardships that I have and this trauma, and just let it like kill my soul, like in ex- in the existential way, mm-hmm. and write this like haunting poem you know yeah instead of like instead of talking about your personal problems on the page which can be problematic sometimes especially when you come from first gen family and that's the thing with the book sometimes it's like you know i don't know what they think about like the the poems about real experience you know like Mm -hmm. sometimes mexican families don't want you to talk about their problems publicly you know things like that so i was always conflicted with that and the prose poem was a way for me to channel, you know, generational trauma and just like all these social issues and have it come in disguise through a mask, through a persona, through a metaphor, through a symbol, through dark imagery, um, through surrealism, absurdism. So that's that's how it um it it was a way to a little be be a little bit more creative and um it was an outlet, an escape. Yeah. I think my other question um, had to do with um, there's not a whole lot of Spanish in the collection, but there is some Spanish in the collection. Mm. Um, and in a lot of the cases where you do use Spanish, the following line is the translation into English. Yeah. And so I was wondering if that was more of your choice or like your editor's choice or. No, my like editor the... didn't really have anything to do with, with any of the. Mm. It was more the organization. The first section, mm. the editor organized it and made it. Um, more um seamless and and more um cohesive but the spanish is like if you talk to me and like we're hanging out for a couple weeks you're gonna notice he doesn't speak a lot of spanish you know like i know it but like i grew up the way we grew up in northern orange county like you didn't speak spanish like like Mm -hmm. you maybe spoke it at home but like when i when my parents would speak spanish to me i would always speak english to them you know and it wasn't because i was like an awful person is that you don't really know as a kid you know everybody in your neighborhood we spoke english on the street like um we weren't really aware of like chicano neighborhoods like or spanglish that much um so yeah so kind of my instinct is to speak english you know mm-hmm. and so my spanish was kind of broken when i speak it i would have to think about it um i'm getting better now by like reading spanish poetry out loud in the mornings mm-hmm. and i love that um, and I could see some some growth. I even read a poem in Spanish by memory the other day. Yeah. And when I read, I fucking read. I'm sorry if I'm not, I don't know what I'm supposed <laughs> to so I'll read like Idobro and Neruda and like Octavio Paz and and um, Borges and out loud. So I don't know. Like sometimes I feel like I read it pretty good, but I don't always understand everything that I'm reading. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And also like my family was um, in Mexico they were not formally trained in, in school, you know, so mm-hmm. the the Spanish was more um, slang. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so yeah, I just think that... Oh, and also, another big thing about that, I come from a family of six, and um, I'm, the, I'm on the three youngest side, and my three older siblings are, like, fluent in Spanish because mm-hmm. they grew up with my parents only speaking Spanish to them. And then the three younger ones, we had our older siblings who would speak English to us. Mm. So I noticed that me, my sister, and my twin brother, my twin brother speaks barely any Spanish, like very broken. Like, and he tries, but it just sounds awful. Like, it just sounds really <laughs> like he doesn't speak that well. Um, but my sister is getting better. But my three older siblings, like I said, they're fluent. Um, I don't know if they write in Spanish, but so yeah. That's like it's not like over here, like where you see Juarez in the background, and you're mm-hmm. always aware that you're Chicano, and like everyone around you is Chicano. Over there, where I grew up initially, it was like more like a we were probably like 30, 40 percent Mexicans, and then like 30 percent white, 
and then like two black kids. There was not a lot of black people either, mm. and uh, some Asian people. So it was it was more like a middle class suburb. Yeah. But we were living in a two bedroom apartment, so you know the, we went to these schools that were you know good schools. They said, but um, we were kind of crammed in there, in the in the apartment. So. I don't know if that explains anything that you have. <laughs> I mean, yeah. um, I guess, yeah, no, I think you answered it, yeah. yeah. But I try to, like, put Spanish in there, mm -hmm. um, you know. And I think as as my books, um, there'll be more Spanish in there. But, like, I can't really write in Spanish. Like, if you told me to write an essay in Spanish, mm -hmm. I don't think I could do that. I've never tried to do that, you know. I don't really have formal training in Spanish. The Spanish that I do read is just Spanish poetry that I've just collected over the years, but it's a bit of um, not not formally trained, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I think we were talking about that yesterday and just like particularly because of your poem, Broken, we are wondering like maybe that's why he's not including so much Spanish in here because like that's still kind of looming in the back of his mind. It might be something um, subconscious or it just might be a, a choice, right? The, mm, I know what you mean, but <laughs> not really. Like growing up, um, it was more, like I said, the younger siblings did not speak that well. Mm -hmm. But we understood most of it, you know. And my parents also, um, since it was northern Orange County, they had to learn English. Like they, they speak almost like fluent English, you know. So both of my parents speak a lot of English. So, um, and also I didn't know, like when, like now I heard that like if a kid speaks, if their parents speaks to you in Spanish, you, sh you should answer in Spanish, obviously. But I didn't know that growing up. I, I was just like translating it and answering in English. So my Spanish um, regressed, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, like I said, I'm getting better at it now. Um, but as far as like conscious decisions, not really like, um, I do have my next collection, Portrait of the Artist as a Brown Man, well, in two collections. Um, I have a lot of odes to, like, um, Ode to the Piñata and a lot of Ode to different Mexican restaurants in the area. So I, it's, I think there's more Spanish in that one. But, um, you know, my friends that were Chicano growing up in, in northern Orange County, they were, like, fourth, fifth generation, so they didn't speak any Spanish. Like, or understand it, you know? So I was pretty much the only one who kind of mm. understood it in, in um, the circles that I grew up in. Um, and it wasn't until later till we moved to, to Norwalk, Southeast LA, that, um, my, that I started speaking more Spanish, you know? Mm. And, and like I said, now I'm working on it. And I didn't think it was possible to, like, get better at it, but I do notice um, if you read... Pretty much, uh, it will build, build a little bit. I have two more questions, but they're kind of like final, final questions. I don't know if anyone wants to <laughs> ask anything else. No, I think, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I just wanted to give a shout out. Another thing I was thinking about uh, last night, uh, oh, I, I love the shout out to Las Cafeteras. Oh, There's yeah. some, uh, some friends I met a while back when they were on tour, so like, uh oh. It's cool to see see people you know come yeah. out in a book. So. And mm -hmm. uh, did you choose them because they're LA based? You know. Yeah, LA? yeah. They they, um, they kind of came about like ten years ago when uh, Chicano Batman was also coming out, and they were from they were locally. My twin brother went to school with um, I think his name is Henry, the one of the Cafeteras members. They went to Cal State Long Beach together, and they were in in uh, in. Uh, some like Rasa organizations together, and my twin brother was more political. He was like a um, political, si political science major. It wasn't. I don't. I don't think it was Mecha. I think it was Hermanos Unidos, maybe something like that. Yeah. But um, even though he didn't really speak Spanish, like I said, he was kind of more Chicano growing up. He would dress like a cholo, shave his head, and uh, you know he had like the creased pants and. So he, he kind of went the wrong way for a little bit, and um, he had some problems. And but um, when he went to college, he was more organized and and um, political. And so yeah, a lot of my um, 
those prose poems with with the t-shirts they pay homage to local bands rage against the machine cafeteras chicano batman and also um mf doom who i really grew up um listening to in underground hip-hop and i thought his delivery his flow his cadence his non sequiturs and his uh, absurdist humor were really influential like when i was in college i was listening more mf doom and immortal technique and rhyme sayers um typical cats i was listening more underground hip-hop than i was reading shakespeare you know the plays or anything like that by far right yeah cool yeah i really enjoyed that whole like rage um being your inspiration and and how a lot of like um like you saying that hip hop is poetry and things like that. Cause I like to incorporate that in, in my classes too. And I just think that mm. um, a lot of students kind of always just automatically say, Oh, it's poetry. It must be like Shakespeare because that's yeah. what they've been exposed to. And that's what is part of that canon curriculum that they have to learn and, and grow to hate a lot of times. So they don't want to give poetry any kind of exactly. chances mm. and, but when you flip it that way and when you start telling them, like, you know, there's poetry all around you and it's even, even in your hip hop that you listen to, mm-hmm. um, oh, yeah. that's when they, they start to get into it a little more. So I really, really enjoyed that, that too. Yeah, when I, when I was in high school, we did not really read a lot of poetry. I think it was, you know, maybe Keats or something like that, Shakespeare. Mm-hmm. Um, so it wasn't until I started going to the public library and I was uh, reading Neruda and Octavio Paz, and um, I started to see poets who looked like me, Luis Rodriguez. That's when I first read The Concrete River, and My Nature is Hunger, and I was just like blown away. And and um, that's when I knew that I could be a poet. You know, before I was like, I don't know, like I'm not sure if I can do it. You know, but then that's also when I put the work in of reading and and. Um, obsessing about that and and luckily it worked out do you have any poets that you're reading right now any that you think we should be reading yeah oh yeah definitely <laughs> uh, always reading um it's like if if i if i'm an nfl player like i'm gonna lift weights right you know like that's how books are to, to your mind um if you want to be a professional poet so harriet mullen sleeping with the dictionary Ada Limon, The Caring, Alberto Rios, A Small Story About the Sky, Claudia Rankin, Don't Let Me Be Lonely. Um, I'm always reading Udobro in Spanish just because I think his Spanish is beautiful. And um, Neruda. Um, so, yeah, there's, there's a lot. Um, James Tate exposed me to, to surrealism, absurdism. Ray Gonzalez, <clears throat> there's a a surreal prose poet named Maurosa de Giorgio, who is um, from Uruguay, that is like a singular voice, kind of like the Russell Edson of Latin America, I would say. And if you read that in Spanish and English, it's just gorgeous collection. Um, yeah, there's there's a lot out there. Do you do you purchase the book collections or do you find them online to read a, a mix of oh oh yeah i purchased a lot of a lot of them more than more than clothes obviously <laughs> as the same shirt i wore the other night priorities you know? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah it. a lot of books online bookstores and a lot of library um checkouts i don't really do the ebook i i tried for a little bit but i want i kind of want to feel the book and everything and and um so yeah a lot of purchasing of books cool shout out to libraries too (laughs) yeah oh absolutely oh definitely um i guess to kind of bring it back to what we were discussing in the beginning of the podcast i wanted to ask you if you had any advice for community college students and so that's who we serve um Daily, so and it's where you come from, also. Yeah. So I thought, you know, maybe we could end it with that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think um, when you find something you enjoy, that you have a passion for, um, you make it your priority. You put the work in. You take it seriously, and um, 
and um, you you just put your head down and and, and um, obsess about it, and it takes time. You know, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. So enjoy those little small victories along the way, and um, enjoy the people you meet along the way, the teachers that that help you along the way. You know, tell them you appreciate them, um, and you know, like I said, if you want to be a writer, um, the essential thing is is the obsession and with reading and and then also pay attention to the teaching aspect of being a writer and and um do some research on that and and um i think that will really help you balance out the artistic with the professional and and um so you can make a living off of it as well mm. that's great advice <laughs> yeah thank you for that you're reminding me that um, maybe we can stop by the the bookstore right here and uh, talk, drop off a copy, one of yours. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, we thank you so much, Jose, for uh, not only doing the podcast but for visiting our campuses and visiting our students and sharing your work with us and sharing your time. My pleasure. Here Anytime. In Anytime. And hopefully, yeah. you'll come back when you have your your new book, I'm new sure collection. I'll be back, yeah. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Literally Literary, recorded at Power at the Pass and brought to you by Border Senses. This episode, we continued our discussion on Bad Mexican, Bad American by Jose Hernandez Diaz. If you haven't read it, we hope we inspire you to pick up a copy. Join us on our next episode and follow us on Instagram at literallyliterary.ep.